The great thing about physics is that it makes the simplest things mind-bogglingly complicated. Take space. What is it? Well, space is whatever's between here and there. Not that complicated. But, but, physicists say, space should have quantum properties. Space itself might be both here and there. And what the heck does this mean? Well, no one knows so much about the theory, but we also have experiments in physics, and this new experiment, which I just read about the other day, brought us a step closer to figuring out what space is. Or did it? Let's have a look. This video comes with a quiz that lets you check how much you remember. Time is what prevents everything from happening at once, as John Wheeler put it. And according to John Barrow, space is what prevents everything from happening in Cambridge. I'm just back from a trip to Cambridge, and for all I can tell, the only thing that happens there is rain. But let's not make things more complicated than they need to be. Both Johns were referring to space and time in Einstein's good old-fashioned theories. Einstein developed his theories before quantum mechanics ruined everything, and this is why they don't contain stuff like the uncertainty principle or dead and alive cats. In Einstein's theory, space and time are coordinate grids, basically. They tell you when and where things happen, like rain in Cambridge on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You get the idea. Einstein also told us, however, that space and time react to matter inside by curving. Trouble is that this responsiveness of space-time doesn't sit well with quantum physics. Not at all. The issue is that, according to quantum physics, particles can be in two places at the same time. And particles have masses that curve space-time. So where do they curve space-time if they're in two places? Quantum mechanics doesn't tell us because it knows nothing about the curvature of space-time. And Einstein's theory can't tell us because it knows nothing about quantum physics. What we do know, though, is that the way that space works in Einstein's theory can't be right, because somehow we need to account for those particles which can be in two places at once. To sort this out, we need a theory in which space can be in two places at the same time, which makes no sense. And that basically is the problem. Since gravity is just the curvature of space and time, a theory that gives them quantum properties is also a theory of quantum gravity. Now, I've worked on quantum gravity after I finished my PhD 20 years ago. Back then, everyone kept telling me that quantum gravity is basically philosophy, because it doesn't have any measurable consequences. That's because gravity is an incredibly weak force compared to the other forces. Think about it. If you pin a magnet to your fridge, then the magnetic force of that tiny thing is stronger than the gravitational pull of the entire planet. And the forces inside atomic nuclei are even stronger. That's why nuclei stick together, and good thing that they do. And so the story went, we can't test the quantum properties of space. That would require enormously high energies, a particle collider the size of the Milky Way. That's a common estimate. But I've tried to tell people that makes no sense. Gravity is different from all those forces because it can add up. It doesn't neutralize like all the other forces do. That's why we experience it so prominently in daily life. To measure quantum gravitational effects, you just have to measure the quantum properties of objects that are heavy enough. I no longer work in the field, that's a long story, but I'm super excited to see that there are now several experimental groups trying to test quantum gravity, and not with Milky way size colliders, but in the laboratory. This then brings me to the new experiment, because they found a new way to measure very small gravitational forces. You see, the issue is that if you take elementary particles like those in the standard model, electrons, quarks, muons, and all our best friends, their gravitational pull is so tiny we can't measure it, so you can't test quantum gravity with them. If you take something heavy, like a planet, then you can measure the gravitational field all right, but you can't measure its quantum properties. That's because normally quantum properties go away the larger the object. 
unless you treat them very, very carefully. And that's what they did in this experiment. They put a tiny magnet about the weight of a milligram into a superconducting container, which is cooled to near absolute zero. That superconducting container generates a magnetic field and that keeps the magnet trapped. It levitates on the container and because it's so carefully isolated, it can do quantum things like being in two places at once. Have a look at their experiment. It looks a little like the quantum computers at Google and IBM, doesn't it? These different levels you see here are all noise buffers with these tubes belonging to the different stages of cooling. Then they take a fairly heavy weight of about 2.4 kilogram, put it on a wheel, rotate the wheel and move it from one side to the other of this container with the levitating magnet. The thing is now that the gravitational pull from the moving weight should affect the levitating magnet. This will make the tiny magnet swing relative to the container with the frequency that depends on the position of the wheel. And that they can measure because it creates a current for which they have a super sensitive detector in the container. The reason they put this weight on a wheel is that this way they know the effect must come with a particular frequency and that makes it easier to identify. It stands out against the noise basically. And what you can see here is that the motion of the magnet indeed responds to the wheel being moved. The force that they measured was a tiny 30 atto newton. That's not the smallest force ever measured. And that also brings me to the question, what do you want to do with it? Remember that what we want to know is what the quantum properties of space and time are. For this, you need to measure the gravitational field of an object in a superposition of two places. But this is not what this experiment measures. It measures the gravitational field of the heavy weight with a quantum sensor, that's the levitating magnet. This isn't what you want to measure to test quantum gravity. Yes, it's something with quantum and something with gravity, but that doesn't mean it's quantum gravity. However, one thing that you can do instead of directly measuring the gravitational pull of a quantum object is to measure the effect of the gravitational pull of two quantum objects on each other. In a setup like this, that basically becomes a question of how the thing responds to vibrations but I'm not sure how you'd extract quantum gravitational effects from that. So I still think that the best approach is that pursued by the group of Marcus Aspermeyer in Vienna, which tries to directly measure the gravitational pull of small quantum objects by bringing microscopic sensors as close to these objects as possible. Then again, it's good to have a variety of experiments and whatever they'll do next, I'll let you know, so stay tuned. Oh yes, and subscribe. I'm not doing this YouTube thing right, am I? Did you know I have a quantum mechanics course on brilliant.org? It's a beginner's course that you can take without any background knowledge. It'll introduce you to topics such as interference, superpositions and entanglement, the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. And afterwards, you can continue learning more about your favorite topics in science, computer science or maths. All courses on Brilliant come with interactive visualizations and follow-up questions. It's really an easy and fun way to learn something new. If you want to try it out for free, use our link brilliant.org slash Sabine. First 30 days are free and the first 200 of you to use this link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.